This is Reverend Kirk Lawton, minister at Ocean Lakes Family Campground, and this is our podcast. Our prayer is that this message may enrich your life as you find God especially meaningful to you. Thank you for worshiping with us. Once again, we are so happy to welcome you to our worship service on this Sunday morning from Ocean Lakes Family Campground here in Myrtle Beach. It's a joy to have you to share the services with us. Let me begin today by telling you several experiences I've had over the past several years. Some time ago, I stood in a hospital corridor with with two heartbroken parents. Their only son lay in a nearby room not expected to live through the night. Only a few days before, this little boy had been robust, healthy, apparently as any young child, but now he depended on a ventilator, a mechanical breathing device, for the little bit of life that he still held on to. As I talked with that father and mother in the corridor, they tried to be brave and courageous, but through swollen eyes, that father said to me, Preacher, In a time like this, it's really hard to have faith. Both parents were Christians, very faithful church members, but this man was simply reflecting a question which has been asked many, many times over the years, a question which our master Jesus even asked when he was hanging on the cross just before he died. He asked the question, My God, my God, why? On another occasion, I stood at the bedside of a young lady who recently learned that she was expecting another child. She was thrilled to have her third child. She had two boys earlier. After only a few weeks of conception, complications had set in though, and there was a real possibility of a necessity of having to terminate this little life within her because of an ectopic pregnancy. And the shock of sadness on hearing this news, the question welled up in that young mother's heart, the simple question, why? Why this? I stood at the bedside of another man on another occasion in the hospital as I heard him pour out his feelings to me, feelings of discouragement over a prolonged sickness that he was having to endure. He was from a Christian family, apparently, and this young man had been brought up to believe that it was a sin ever to ask the question, why? It was not the time for me to go into a long theological explanation of why I don't believe it's a sin, but he was asking that question that had been bottled up within his heart for so long. Never question God, never ask why, and now all those repressed feelings had begun to show themselves in some problems. He was desperately wanting to cry out, even as Jesus did on the cross, that honest question, my God, my God, why? Now, I would not be so bold this morning as to suggest even that I have the complete answer to any of these questions or many other questions that have been raised during these past days of this coronavirus in which we are all having to endure a lot of adjusted schedules and even grief in the part of many families. But I do think that we can come up with some approaches to some questions which may be of help to us. Instead of answering all those questions immediately, let me ask another question in return. How do we explain all the goodness in the world? We've all heard the question asked, why is there so much evil in the world? Well, that's a common question. But let's turn that around. And let's ask, why is there so much goodness in the world? We've seen many expressions over these past weeks of the goodness that has erupted out of many people's hearts as they have shown love and goodness to each other, even during these trying days. Goodness and evil are two opposing mysteries in the world. Now, we know that God is good, but if we say that God is the one who brings good and who brings evil to us, then we've got a greater question on our hand. 
uh, how can we solve the problem of evil by saying that there's no God? Some people do that. Or that God is not working to help us in our evil situations. Let's suppose that God were to allow you or me to try our hand at improving this world he's made. What would you do? Would you remove all the evil and suffering from this world? Would you leave no possibility anywhere for the problem of sin or suffering? Well, then you'd have to rule out the ability of people to make their own choices, to choose their path of life. And if you didn't do that, then you'd be an unjust judge. No, the absence of conflict does not bring real happiness, as some people think. Happiness does not come through living life on a soft cushion or being born, as they used to say, with a silver spoon in your mouth. There is a story about a man who died. Now, this is a dream he had. It's not in reality, perhaps, but it a, it's a, has a real story, moral to it. About a man who died and who awakened in a world of luxurious surroundings all around him. An attendant nearby told this man that all he had to do was to ask for anything he wanted and it would immediately be his. Is there a book that you've been wanting to read? It will appear right there before you. Uh, is there a beautiful painting that you've always admired? It's yours. Just ask for it. After a year or two of this luxury, this man became hopelessly bored. So he said to the attendant, I'm sick and tired of all this everlasting ease. Now I want to do something that I cannot have unless I work for it. But he was told that this would be an impossibility in the world in which he was now living. So upon hearing this news, the man blurted out in a fit of anger, well, if that's the case, I do not care to stay here in this place where I am. I prefer to go to hell. Whereupon the attendant said to him, And just where do you think you are, sir? Maybe this is not the best world that we can imagine, but I doubt that any of us can improve on the way that God has arranged things for us. Suffering comes to us all, and our task is to accept it even when we cannot understand it, when we cannot explain the reason why we're having to suffer. But there's something more that needs to be said about this. Trouble can be put to good use. God does not expect us simply to throw up our hands in resignation and fold into the wallpaper every time trouble comes our way. Often God has a lesson that he will teach us in the midst of our trouble. He doesn't send the trouble. Everything that comes from God is good, not evil. But when trouble comes our way, he can bring a blessing out of it. You know, Jesus had a remarkable way of taking trouble and turning it inside out. He had a way of making suffering his servant rather than his master. The writer of Hebrews said it very plainly when he said that Jesus was made perfect through sufferings. And that word perfect doesn't mean without any problems. It may, means complete. Jesus was made complete, and we know he was perfect, of course. Dr. John Redhead says that a thorn in the flesh can plow the hard surface of a cold heart, can make it good ground for the growth of a plant named sympathy. Another great preacher of bygone days was Dr. E. Stanley Jones, one day when he was on a trip in the Himalaya mountains, a storm struck. He was watching an eagle that was perched over there some distance away. And he was afraid as this storm got closer, that eagle was probably be dashed to its death when the storm got to him. But as he watched, the storm drew closer and closer. The eagle set its massive wings so that the heart of the wind blew that eagle was able to use the wind and rise higher and higher by it. The trouble that we experience can be put to good use. We can make trouble our master, not our servant, by letting it make the best of us. Now, the problem of suffering and trouble in our Christian life 
is not going to be solved, of course, either by acceptance of it or by trying to put it to good use. Those are two good ideas, perhaps, but, but that doesn't satisfy us. Some of life's evils need to be abolished. Every bit of suffering in this world is not something that God has kindly placed down in our laps. There is some suffering that is not God's intention to have happen at all. It has no rightful place in this world God has created. When Abe Lincoln was a very young man, he made a trip by boat from Illinois down the Mississippi River to, to New Orleans. That boat made several stops along the way. On one of these stops, Abe Lincoln happened to see a young man who was sold as a slave on an auction block. When Lincoln saw this horrible event, right then and there, Abe Lincoln made a promise to himself that had far-reaching results. Abe Lincoln said, if I ever get a chance to hit that thing, he was talking about slavery, he said, I'm going to hit it hard. And he did. He signed the Emancipation Proclamation sometime later. The Christian solution to the problem of slavery is not in explaining it away, but rather in abolishing that evil altogether. Let me ask you, are you doing anything to abolish that evil that you may see around you every day? Oh, to be sure, I know you're not going to wake up some morning and say, look, I think I'll go out and abolish some evil today. That's not the way that works, of course. But let's be practical for a moment. Are there any scars that you find in your own heart, maybe your home, or in someone you love because of a failure to express genuine love when that love was so desperately needed? Now, what are you doing now to help heal those wounds, to help erase those scars as you give now a positive expression of your love? Has a broken marriage brought to you a disappointment or maybe to someone dear to you? You can't go back and undo all, undo all the hurt that may have been experienced. You can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. But is there anything you can do perhaps to help someone you know who can avoid the pitfall that was so hurtful to you? Has the abuse of alcohol or some other drug brought about an intolerable situation in your home or in the home of someone you love? And what is your attitude toward that evil? Is it one of mild, good-natured acceptance? Or do you take a courageous stand for a conviction that you have, even in the face of contrary public opinion, and even when it means taking an opposite view from many people all around you, those people whose acceptance you crave, but you're going to take a stand for what you believe is right. God does not intend for us just to fold our hands and blandly accept all the world's evils. There are some situations in our lives where we're called on to stand up and to be counted and to continue to wage war against the evil that is surrounding us a war that we wage with all the tenacity of an angry bulldog. I wish I knew who to give credit to, but an unknown author has expressed it this way. I want to let go, but I won't let go. There are battles to fight by day and by night for God and the right, and I'll never let go. I want to let go, but I won't let go. I'm sick, it is true, worried and blue and worn through and through, but I won't let go. I want to let go, but I won't let go. I will never yield. What? Lie down on the field and surrender my shield? No, I'll never let go. I want to let go, but I won't let go. May this be my song through legions of wrong. Oh God, keep me strong that I may never let go. A remarkable lady by the name of Corrie ten Boom, who with her family helped Jews to escape the Nazi Holocaust during World War II, 
has left a legacy for us that we can still hear about. She and her family helped to save the lives of 800 Jews back in her day. Cora's father was a jeweler and he was a watchmaker. She had two sisters, one brother, and her father and her mother lived in this house in a place near Amsterdam in the Netherlands. They were very active and faithful members of the Dutch Reformed Church. And this family had deep respect for the persecuted Jews in their community. The work to save the lives of Jewish citizens, however, was betrayed by a neighbor in the community who informed the Nazis that they were hiding Jews in their house. They were caught, they were arrested, they were imprisoned. Miraculously, several of these Jews were able to escape the, the capture by the authorities as they hid in a secret room in the upper area of their house. By the grace of God, Corey Ten Boom was able to survive and to share her remarkable story. One of her books that she has written is entitled The Hiding Place. And in that book, Corey Ten Boom tells about her experience of traveling by train with her father down over to Amsterdam to purchase watches and parts for the repair shop back at his home. Although that train trip took only about a half hour, Corey treasured those moments of traveling on the train with her father. Here's how she described one of those trips. Oftentimes I would use that trip home to bring up things that were troubling to me since anything I asked at home was always promptly answered by my aunts who lived with us. Once, I must have been a very young girl, I asked father about a poem we had read that winter before in school. There was one line in that poem that went like this, a young man whose face was not shadowed by sex sin. I'd been far too shy to ask my teacher what that word meant. And mama blushed scarlet when I asked her. In those days, it was interesting that sex was never discussed, not even at home. So that line from that poem had stuck in my head. Sex, I was pretty sure, meant whether you were a boy or a girl. And any time the word sin came up in our house, Aunt Jane became, became very angry. But what those two words, sex and sin, when put together, what, what that meant, I could not understand. And so, seated next to my father in the train compartment, I asked him suddenly, Father, what is sex sin? He turned to look at me, and as he always did when answering a question, he did not seem shocked, but he said nothing for a moment. At last he stood up, lifted his traveling case from the compartment overhead, and he set that case, that suitcase, down on the floor. Will you carry this off the train for me, Kari? He asked. So I stood up and reached over and tugged at that suitcase full of watch parts. It was crammed with a lot of materials that he had bought that morning in Amsterdam. It's too heavy, Father. I said, yes, he said, and it would be a pretty poor father who would ask a little girl to carry such a load. It's the same way, Cora, he said, with knowledge. Some knowledge is too heavy for little children. When you're older and stronger, you can bear it, but for now, you must trust your father to carry it for you. And I was satisfied more than satisfied, wonderfully at peace. There were answers to this question and all my hard questions, but for now, I was content to leave these questions in my father's keeping. Corey Ten Boom closes that chapter in this book I've referred to, The Hiding Place, by relating one other experience in her life that happened when she was still a very, very young girl in her words, she explained it this way. I was following Mama and my sister Nolly 
up a dark, straight flight of stairs where cobwebs clutched, clutched at our hair and mice scurried away ahead of us. The building where we were going was less than a block from our house. It probably was a century newer than our house, but that had, they had there no ant as we had to scrub and to clean the house. We were going to see one of the many poor families in the neighborhood whom my mama had adopted. The night before, a little baby had died at that house. And with a basket of her own fresh bread, Mama was making the prescribed call on the family. She toiled painfully up the railless stairs, often stopping to catch her breath. At the top of the stairs, a door was found, opening into a single room that obviously a room was used for cooking and sleeping, eating quarters, all the same room. There were already many visitors there, most of them standing because of lack of chairs. Mama went at once over to the young, grief-stricken mother. Just to the right of the door was a homemade crib where there was a baby. I stood frozen in the doorway. It was strange that a society that hid the fact of sex from children made no effort to shield children from the fact of death. I stood staring at that tiny little unmoving form in that crib, and my heart was thudding strangely in, against my ribs. My sister Nolly, always braver than I, had walked over to that crib and had stretched out her hand and touched that little ivory white cheek. I longed to do that too, but I held back, afraid. For a while, curiosity and terror struggled in my being, and at last I walked over and I put one finger on that small, curled hand. It was cold. It was cold as we walked back to our home, cold as I washed for supper, cold even in that snug, gas-lit dining room. Between me and each familiar face around the table crept those small, icy fingers of that baby. For all that Aunt Jane had talked about it, death for me had been only a word. Now I knew that it really could happen. If it happened to that baby, it could happen to Mama, to Father even to my sister Betsy or Nolly. Still shivering with that cold, I followed Nolly up to our room and I, I crept into bed beside her. At last, we heard Father's footsteps winding up the stairs. It was the best moment of every day for me. When he came up to tuck us in, we never fell asleep until Father had come and arranged the blankets in his special way and laid his hand for a moment on each of our heads. And then we tried not to move even a toe until we fell asleep. But that night, as he stepped through the door, I burst into tears. I need you, Father, I sobbed. You can't die. You can't. Beside me in the bed, Nolly sat up Father, she said, we went to see Mrs. Hoog today. Cora didn't eat her supper or anything. So Father sat down beside me on that narrow bed. Corey, he began saying gently, when you and I go to Amsterdam on the train, when do I give you your ticket? I sniffed a few times thinking about that and then I answered, well, Father, you give me my ticket just before we get on the train. Exactly, he said, Corey. And our wise Father in heaven knows when we're going to need things too. Don't run ahead of him, Corey. 
when the time comes that some of us will have to die, you will look into your heart and you will find the strength that you need just at the right time. Cora did have to go through the death of her father and her mother and her sister Betsy and so many friends and the Holocaust. God will not let us look beyond a bend of the road out there, but whatever lies beyond the bend of the road, we have the assurance of knowing that we don't have to walk that road alone. The beautiful 23rd Psalm says, For thou art with me. In spite of all that you and I can do, we must finally come to understand that we're simply human beings. Now we see through a glass darkly. One of these days we'll see face to face. We never can find refuge and comfort with all this world's sufferings that we have to endure until we know the God of all comfort. David in the Old Testament, the author of the, many of the Psalms, put it this way, For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the cover of thy wings. And so, my dear friend, as we face our situations that we're in these days, maybe a good question to ask ourselves, have I made God my strong tower? Only when he has become this for you can you find strength to meet the challenges of every day. Only when you've decided to let his son Jesus the one who is victor over sin and death and the grave, when he can become your rock, your shelter, your fortress, only then can you have a faith that is ready to face. Will you pray with me, please? Oh God, we all have trouble. We all have problems. And many of these are known only to you, Lord. But we pray that we might be willing to let you become our tower, our strength, our shelter. You've promised that your son Jesus truly is the one that we can trust. He is our solid rock. So we pray, Lord, that whatever we face these days, we might surrender to his strong arm and know that your strength is all we need and that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. This we pray in his wonderful, strong name. Amen. And once again, we're so grateful that you shared our service with us today from Ocean Lakes Family Campground here in Myrtle Beach.